All right, it's recording. Uh, cool. I am on the phone with Evan, and Evan has this property that's on the screen, so pod people can't see it, but maybe maybe I'll put this on YouTube and then people can see it. And uh, I have now been on the phone with Evan for about 3.2 minutes, and uh, uh, Evan has informed me that he has listened to only one of my podcasts, so I think Evan doesn't know what he's getting into here. Um, it's very possible, yeah. <laughs> at the same time, one of my Patreon peeps is like, hey, I would really like to hear more stuff where uh, it's like site evaluations. And so uh, uh, at the same time, Evan foolishly parted with the 100 bucks for the advice I'm about to give. <laughs> Evan, I'm not giving you your money back, okay? Hey, oh. the ship has sailed. Oh, look, there's a house that's like near yours that has solar panels on it. That's kind of nice. Definitely. Okay. I, uh, have, I have noticed that house. I wonder, I wonder if there's a way. So I see your, your, thing, your image here. Is there a way to kind of zoom? I don't know if there's a way to zoom. Wait, you know, a, if I was smarter, I would have linked you right to what I took the screenshot of, right? Okay, I'm zooming. I, I did it. I, I'm, whoa. What are you doing? Now it'll only show me. Wait. Wait, there we go. Boom. There, look at that. Yeah, I feel smart and stuff. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to guess that this is three quarters of an acre. Am I close? Pretty close, yeah. We're just shy. I think they call it, it where we are about a, a farmer's acre. So I think they wanted to give you just shy of one because it probably had to do with voting rights or something, but essentially about an acre. Okay, and um, you're near a train track. Um, so, you know, you get to flatten all the pennies you want. That's, that's gotta be nice. Um, and we get infinite road spikes too. We have a lot of those rail spikes just kicking around. So they're, they're really good wedges. You'd be surprised. Oh, nice. Nice. You, you can get some welding art going on. Okay. <laughs> good idea. Uh, it looks like you've got a backyard. It looks like you've got a lot of trees. What kind of trees are these? They are, uh, primarily oaks. So they're pretty tall oaks and, um, this, I mentioned actually a little further down here, but there's some of this cover has been removed. So not a ton of it, but where we, where I wrote garden, naturally that would be a pretty crappy garden under that cover. So those trees are actually gone. Um, um, and those are actually some pines where you see the word garden. But, um, but the majority of the tree cover we have here is, uh, is our tall, I believe they're red oaks. And then we've got some, um, some pines that are a little shorter. But you actually don't even see this here that I'm looking at. Okay, okay. So, um, oh. and this is just to show you that we're near a whole bunch of like farmland. And so we get a lot of visitors in our yard. So like that's relative to the train tracks. And then I've got a little red dot there in the lower left corner where we are. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's just to point out, we get a lot of friends that like to visit our, our spot here. So I think the more we plant that's interesting to the local fauna, <laughs> uh, the more they're going to come enjoy our property. Which is kind of one of the things I was, you know, I, you know, I wasn't sure your thoughts on, you know, what are sort of some natural strategies I can take to sort of, you know, knowing that they're just going to always enter the yard. Um, okay. You know, it's not. So by friends, you mean non-human friends. Non-human friends, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's skunks. It's um, a lot of smaller things like that. We also have fox that'll come visit, the occasional coyote. Um, that's the majority of it. Sometimes some wild turkeys. We've seen some deer. Okay. Where, where are you, like? in the world? So I'm in the Northeast, I'm in Massachusetts. So we're, our zone is, um, I, think, I think it's 6A, I think that's what I figured out. First time I've looked it up actually since we moved. All right, all right. And this is the garden we put in. So, so on the left where you see that fence, there were pine trees there, we removed them. So now this is a lot more sun. Um, and this is, you know, the fence isn't done of course. <laughs> uh, but this, yeah, this uh, is, what's this that black is some, over here? Yeah, that's some compost from, um, there's a local pig farmer. It's actually not pig manure, but it's a, he's, he's a pig farmer, but he also has a huge compost operation. So a good friend of mine has uh, a big old truck. And so he's able to bring that in as much as I need it. And it's relatively affordable. Naturally, I, I want to not always bring inputs in and, and be making it myself. So I do have worm bins on site. Um, but this is this was sort of a kickstart because this area needed some 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 organic material to kind of get things rolling. You can kind of see on the left the sandy material, that, like how sandy it is there. That's really what I was working with under the grass. Okay, okay. And then the this little pile in front of the uh, compost. Yeah, that's just uh, that's some some fresh, fairly fresh wood chips. I have I have a smaller pickup truck 
that um, I can go locally to a landscaping company and get wood chips for like, like a, you know, a few dollars a yard all day long. Um, so that's just some chips that I was using to make make paths and um, and also just to, to cover soil wherever I can. As you can see, I didn't do a great job in this photo, but I'm just working my way through them. All right. <clears throat> The people that are normal listeners of the podcast know that I discourage people from hiring me as a consultant because I'm just going to make you cry. And uh, and you, sir, have stumbled into this nightmare that's about to happen. And and so I, I part of me wants to apologize, part of me wants to point and laugh. Uh, and and it's like, but we're off we're off to a grim start because you don't even know what I'm going to say yet. But I think most of the pod people already have heard this so many times, and, and so I'm going to. But, it, but here it comes. Here, it's coming. Brace yourself. <laughs> I'm holding on. I'm holding on tight. Wearing, you should wear a cup right about now. Wearing a cup would be good. Um, all right. Buying commercial compost. Okay. The, it, I, I was about to say, like, maybe this is going to be okay because it's like, oh, I got it from a pig farmer. And then I thought you were going to go on to say, okay, it's pig shit and this other stuff from the farm and it's a totally organic operation and and then i'd be like maybe this is okay but but then you took a hard left and you're like doesn't have any pig shit in it though so i can see some grasses growing in the top of it and it looks like you know towards this side of the pile there might be something with some leaves growing in it or it might just be a leaf that fell on it yeah that um, fell but you are right about the about the other stuff growing in the top. It's sort of a, a grassy, yeah, something that okay. came with it for sure. Okay, no, having stuff grow in it is great, especially if it's not grass, because the problem with any purchased compost is that all of it contains persistent herbicides, and the persistent herbicides are broadleaf herbicides. So what happens is, is that the things that you want to grow in a wonderful vegetable garden turn out to be dominantly not grass. You, you want like a tomato plant. A tomato plant is not grass. It's a broadleaf. And so then the, uh, the broadleaf poison that is in this commercial compost is, of course, going to poison your broadleaf, your tomatoes, or your squashes, or whatever it is that you're trying to grow in there that's not grass. So it's kind of like, oh no, don't put that on your garden, man. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to put it on my lawn because someday I want to grow other things besides lawn. Um, it's like, you know, I think a lot of us are going to try to grow a garden and and, and grow all kinds of things to have this wonderful permaculture jungle that we're going to install. And it's going to, and the quality of the food is going to be far better than anything you get at the grocery store. Unless, of course, you were to poison it all. And then it's worse than the stuff you can get at the grocery store. And so it's kind of like, ah, oh, man, ah. Oh. So um, now that you have it, I, I'm not even sure what to say to do with it. I would, if, it, if I bought your property and I saw that, I, I would haul it away or give it to a neighbor or something like that. Hey, man, you want some free compost? I'll give it to you for free. But, hey, it's it's your choice. But but I'm nervous because I'm not seeing a lot of broadleaf stuff growing out of it. And when you use commercial compost that has the persistent herbicides in it, then um, sometimes it's like the upsides outweigh the downsides and your plant will do better. But then if you make your own homemade compost and then you you put that on your garden you'll on a different part of your garden you'll find that part of your garden is generally like far lusher and then of course there's going to be those times where you go to put this stuff on your garden and everything just simply dies and and you might think i'm exaggerating but um not only have i heard from a lot of people but i have a whole video on youtube where i visited a bunch of different places and that's exactly what happened a bunch of different places and it was randomly i was there to, to talk to him about other things and it's like oh yeah my garden's all dead mm. and then one gal it's like you know her her passion in life is gardening and so she said she had to pay three thousand dollars to basically have her whole garden dug up hauled to the dump 
and then she brought in new topsoil from another site. It's it's sad. It's it's just grim. So there you go. Do you see what I'm saying about I'm just gonna make you cry? <laughs> no, that's actually I think that's helpful because you know there's due diligence that I now need to do is understand like what, you know because my understanding of the guy's operation and I'll make this brief because like I'm not gonna try to necessarily defend because I don't know him personally is that you know he he's the local guy that the people who do tree chipping and service will bring and he explicitly has he's sort of like you know the Seinfeld soup Nazi where if you bring branches or anything over certain sizes you're not allowed there again and. So my understanding is that he does an organic operation with regards to the way he turns the piles and he doesn't spray, but I don't know where he's sourcing, you know, right? So like, it's very possible things are being sprayed that he's getting chips from. So point very much taken. Um, and um, as far as the how it's working so far, just for what it's worth, you know, I have had mixed results. There were some things that I got seedlings that I didn't grow myself. And those didn't do well with this, like this basically didn't do great with those. But all the tomatoes that I started to receive this year, this was what we basically grew them in. And the tomatoes themselves look pretty good. Um, we've had very good luck this year, but that's not to yeah. say the problems that you mentioned don't exist. So point very all much right. taken. And, and um, I'm gonna have to really think that over for sure. All right, now let's talk about the, the pile of uh, wood chips you have. Um, I mean, okay, so you got a place that has wood chips and you go there and you get it. That's like locally chipped wood. And you're thinking like local, that's great. I'm not, I'm not importing the toxic waste from far away, but <coughs> chances are that, that these wood chips are urban wood chips. And so um, these persistent herbicides are being used more and more and more in urban environments. And in fact, what kind of happens a lot of the times is that somebody has got a lawn and then the guy, they're like, uh, I want to hire a service or I'm going to get this, you know, herbicide or whatever. I want to get it so that I kill all the dandelions in my yard. And it's like, oh, well, we got this great stuff. It's, uh, it, it, it makes, it doesn't hurt the grass at all, but it kills all the dandelions. And, and on top of that, it lasts like five years or more. So you only have to spray it once. Isn't that a deal? And they're like, oh, sweet. That's so much better for the environment, they say. And so... <clears throat> This is those persistent herbicides. So they spray it all over their yard and like, man, look, it killed the dandelions. And for some unknown, mysterious, unrelated reason, my tree died. My tree, which is not a grass, you know? And it's like, ah, crap. Well, you know, now that it's dead, it's threatening my house. It's gonna fall on my house. I gotta call the tree guy to get this out of here. So the tree guy comes and he cuts it out and he's gonna like take a bunch of it and he's going to do what to it he's gonna chip it he's gonna he's gonna make these wood chips and uh it's like man we got way too many of these wood chips i wish we could find some sucker to take this away from, for us and then and then you show up hello <laughs> i'd like some wood chips please and and then uh they're like sweet so what happens is is that this plant this tree has taken this up taken up this poison and then died from it. And then while the poison is still in the tree, it got chipped up and now it, here it is. Now granted, it's possible this, this tree came from like an organic yard and it died of a lightning strike or uh, it died of old age or something else, you know? And that's, that's why it died and got chipped up. And that's why you have it. <clears throat> However, more likely, uh, all the organic stuff, which by the way is probably less than 5%, got mixed in with all the non-organic stuff, which is 95%. And they all have all their different kinds of toxins and whatever else in, in those tree chips. And they're all mixed in and that's, that's what you got there. And so, you know, 50 years ago, doing these two things that you did, brilliant, smart, awesome, quick, cheap, wonderful. And now we're in 2020, everything's different. And it's like, uh, oh, it's so hard now. Uh, in the end, mostly what you wanna get is probably seeds, but there are ways, there are ways to get wood chips that are going to be safe. Um, but it's like, you're going to want to go like 
50 miles out of town to a uh, sawmill <clears throat> where all of their wood comes from forest land and none of it comes from an urban source. Uh, that's going to be pretty safe because the foresters are just too damn cheap to, to pay for that stuff. They don't, they don't, they don't want to pay for any of that. They might put a little bit alongside the roads once in a while. That's about it. Um, but compost operations, they are, they, they are all contaminated. Then it's just a matter of like, have they been able to reduce the contaminants and like somehow have only like 10% of the contaminant that, that their competitors have. And, uh, you know, but there's also other varieties too. Uh, like a lot of times you go and you get something kind of like, that looks like what you got there. Your pig farmer is probably not doing this, but a lot of times they, uh, a lot of the compost operations will get the, uh, the solids from the sewage treatment plant. And now it's, it's 10 times worse. Plus, there's also this other thing too where a lot of composting operations are going to um, basically be bought out by some kind of company that's trying to get rid of their toxic waste. And um, it's very expensive for them to properly dispose of their toxic waste. However, if they relabel it as a plant nutrient, then um, there's a loophole and they can put it into uh, stuff that has the word compost on it. All right, I, I'm <clears throat> sorry, Evan, you, you're, you're just want, you just, you're just shooting for such a lovely, nice thing, and I'm kind of like destroying everything. I wish I had super happy, you know, hearts, flowers, and rainbows things to say for you, but uh, this is this is what I got. Hey, that that is a okay. I guess my question would be, you know, is 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 one of the answers to be making more of these materials just on site? You know, with my worm bins, try to make more compost. Should I? I do have a chipper that just it doesn't work yet. I'm refurbing it, so is it? You know, chipping more stuff that's already here. I mean, I've only lived here a couple of years, so to be fair, the problems you're referring to may already be on my site, right? Okay. You know, I don't know what people in the past have sprayed. So, yeah, what, what you know, I'm gonna what do, do I do? I'm going to do my very best to try to, uh, I don't know, uh, trap you into living your life the way I would live my life if I were there. And, and it's like, I, I, so one of the things you said is, I own a chipper. And, and, it's, and my response to that is, I hope you have a yard sale soon and sell it. Um, I, I mean, when you run the chipper, are you thinking like, man, I just love running this chipper. It smells good. I love the sound of it. It really helps me bond with nature and, and find my zen when I'm running the chipper. I'm not sure. Is that, is that how you feel about your chipper? Uh, I mean, I'm a drummer, but no, I, I, I can't say <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that that's accurate. <laughs> okay. Clearly, I'm asking the wrong guy anyway. But no, okay. So it's still not, even though you're a drummer, it's, you're not finding your zen. Not a fun experience, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even though. Okay. All right. Because I feel the same way. I feel like, wow, this thing as I'm running it is generating all this stink. And it is so loud. And, and it's like, I just don't, I'm not getting my, my permaculture groove on while the chipper's running. Now, granted, I think that, uh, you know, earthworks are important, in which case, like, I'll totally bring in an excavator and do something. Um, <clears throat> but then it's like, when I'm bringing in an excavator to do something, it's kind of like, well, this sure as hell beats doing the shovel for like seven days straight. <clears throat> The excavator is so much faster and it moves everything so fast. So I kind of feel a little bit of diesel shame, but they're coming out with excavators are all electric. I'm so excited about that, but that's another story for another day. But focusing, focusing on this, I kind of feel like anything where I can, I can run a wood chipper on it, I can come up with 20 other things to do instead of that. And so I, I, don't, like, I don't like the wood chippers. <clears throat> so I want to person, but that's a personal choice. Um, and, and I got, I get a lot of people that are like, uh, they don't, they think I'm nuts for not liking the chippers, but all right, let's, let's set the, let's set the chipper aside. 
Um, the big thing is, is that, okay, you've got the better part of an acre. You've got a lot of trees. Any of your conifer trees, so that looks like a cedar in the background, right? Is that a uh, it's very possible. Yeah, I think it is. Okay, I don't know if it's on your property or not. But I can say that um, conifers tend to be not good permaculture players. They, um, they, they tend to be a, a form of allelopathic where uh, not too many things do well growing near them. There are some trees where, like for example, black locust tree, I think everything loves to grow near a black locust tree. Uh, but unlike a conifer, conifers kind of, Seth Holzer says that they make a, a, a conifer desert. So yeah, getting getting rid of conifers seems to me like always always a good plan. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I'm zipping through. Oh look, the fence is now done. Was it done before? <laughs> not not quite done. No, it's okay. still still right. working through it. It's all just right. a closer one. Okay, okay. We got um, one half of it done this morning, though, actually. So we got some. We're making progress. All right, so you're putting this fence up, and uh, I think I think you're. It looks like the kind of fence that goes around a garden because you're going to try and keep something out. What are you trying to keep out? The idea is really just the small, uh, so things like skunks, or we have gophers that like to eat things and they have eaten things. So we know we can't protect things forever, but my, my thinking here is the younger plants, or maybe we have some smaller fruit trees I'm trying to start. Um, but it's it's sort of, uh, this is one of, I think, many strategies that I'm hoping to to employ, um, but largely just, you know, the, those size, size animals, you know, gophers, skunks, things that want to come in and eat what we've made. Okay. All right. All right. Um, <clears throat> that looks like the kind of fence that'll get that job done. Um, I'm, I might possibly uh, put some rocks along the, the bottom uh, just in case mm -hmm. something wants to try to start to dig a little bit or something because the rocks are great because that way air can still get to your fence and, and help your fence uh, uh, keep it from rusting. Um, Great idea. Uh, we'll, right, I'm we'll skipping over ever. all the wordy bits and no, just totally fine. So this uh, we're going to cover in polycarbonate. <laughs> um, it's going to be essentially like a little bit of a garden shed and a place for us to maybe overwinter some plants. Okay. It uh, yeah, it's it's not done yet, obviously. Um, but yeah, it, it needs an overhang for the roof, and um, but it really it's just you know sort of a an in between. We have a big garage, but I wanted something a little closer to the garden for some tools and also maybe a place for us to start some seedlings or at least kind of transition them into the garden from wherever we start them. All right. Um, I'm going to, I mean, there's, a, I think there's a certain, certain kinds of stuff you want me to talk about here. Looking yeah, you at this can, picture. if this doesn't seem worth the time to speak about, we can kind of move, move on. I mean, I think the I only wanna, thing I want to speak through here is passively heating and cooling it, but I mean, that's, you know, this, right. This right. And, and so, but I, I guess what I want to do is um, I, I want to express some frustration over some of the material choices. And, uh, and, it's, and it's probably not what you're hoping to hear about on this, but, but I kind of feel like, okay, um, when, we, when we pursue certain paths, it's like, how do we uh, connect more with nature? How do we have a, a, a life that's a little less toxic? And you know where do the toxins come from? And and of course part of it is 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 living in the city. You, you, if you live in the city, you kind of live in the big brown cloud. And um, I mean I'm sure you've been outside the city and you could look. And then when you guys are approaching it, you're like, wow, <laughs> look at the brown cloud over the over the city. But you know, it's it's actually a combination of like uh, 500 little things everywhere. And so. I, I'm going to try and minimize my time being whiny about some things. So you've got the plastic on the roof. And of course, the plastic's going to off gas and be a, a toxin vector. You've got the wafer board in the back, also called OSB. And uh, that's you know made with a lot of glues, which are going to off gas and as a source of toxins. Wafer board on the floor, same thing. The uh, cement blocks uh, on the bottom, uh, those uh, also known as cinder blocks. Those are going to, of course, contain Portland cement and a variety of other materials. And then almost all cement companies, much like the one I mentioned earlier about compost companies, have been purchased by companies that are trying to get rid of their toxic waste, and they can embed it in the um, in the cements. And so they're they're kind of doing that. <clears throat> There's something plastic back there 
Um, and, and then of course the, I think these chairs may or may not be plastic. I'm not sure. Plastic buckets. Like a, I mean, yeah, finished wood of some kind, but yeah. I, probably I have to, I have to tell you, we're not perfect here either, but we have managed to eliminate all of the wafer board, all of the plywood. And, um, and we have, uh, I, in previous projects long ago, I used the same plastic uh, stuff that you got on your roof up here and I um, I've managed to get away from that as well and so um, all, all I'm saying is is I kind of wish to discourage you from these things now moving along to the general design which you want to hear about as opposed to all this other stuff is that um, uh, like like if you put a lot more let's say let's say it was glass I'm just going to use the word glass um, for reasons skipping past the plastic so let's say the whole thing is covered in glass. Well, um, whatever it is you put in there, there's a little bit of a problem. That is that it's on a sunny day, it's gonna to get too hot. And then on a cold day at night, it's gonna to get too cold because the glass or your plastic is not gonna be very good at insulation. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the thing that we just did the Kickstarter for, um, the uh, uh, truly passive greenhouse experiment, um, uh, I mean, we're doing a lot of weird stuff that's very different from the structure that you're doing here. And of course, we're also, what we're, what we're doing is also, you know, a much bigger build than what you're attempting to do here. So um, it's kind of like, uh, um, this is going to, this is going to be a lot easier to just generally do. The other thing is, is that since you're in a city, then um, it's possible that there's building codes issues to deal with. And um, uh, if, and I think a common thing that I've seen, I, I know that some places that if your whole structure has a, a square footage of under 100 square feet or under 200 square feet, it slips under building code stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the story is in your area. Yeah, it is under 100 square feet, I believe. Okay. <laughs> I know that in other areas, an exception is is to uh, if your structure is on wheels or on skids, uh, and so we do a lot with structures on skids, but for different reasons. Uh, but this looks like it's well under 100 square feet, so you're probably going to uh, shimmy in and be fine. What are you going to do for siding on this? Um, well, I'm rethinking the poly now, but essentially the idea was going to be to, to sheath it with some with more polycarbonate to make it see through okay. and then um, finish it with wood. But I mean, glass sounds like if I'm going to finish it with something um, see through at all, it, glass seems like it'd be a better path naturally because of the outgassing. It's a very good point. Yeah. I, you know, and what I, I think a good thing for me to emphasize at this point is I, I do not wish for you to pursue perfection by these standards, but as instead, as you're trying to, build things once in a while you can find ways to do better you can find ways to um, uh, find find paths that that may not be perfect but <clears throat> have more glass uh, have less glue um, with a big eave you could do less paint things of that nature <clears throat> and then of course try and find a way to get away from um, cement in all of its forms and there's your quick there's your sack of quick reek over there yeah Zoom. point very much taken there there's so. a bobcat look at that it sure is so uh so that's for another property we have obviously bobcat's a little accessory for a city property we haven't developed the other property at all really it's just you know we're just starting to kind of make a small site there and and the goals out there are very i wouldn't say very different but um it's not an urban site. And so, you know, kind of to your point about glues and glass, um, the goals out there are to do things much, you know, with much fewer chemicals. Uh, really right. none if we can avoid it, right? Um, right. Naturally, this is a, I'm, you're looking at a diesel machine as I say that, but uh, naturally we're trying to weigh, you know, a lot of diesel up front as opposed to having to use this longer term. So this will help no. us create some roads and those sorts of things. The cool thing about a piece of diesel equipment like a Bobcat or an excavator is going to be you go in there, you do the job, and then all that diesel goes off site. And so it's not there anymore. So it's, it's 
more likely that you can end up with a permaculture paradise that is your sanctuary and is less toxic. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, while you know I'm really rooting for the future of where we have uh, electric options, we have a, an electric excavator, an electric bobcat, and those things seem to be coming uh, coming soon. Uh, they're just they're just not here yet. Uh, and so in the meantime, we make the best of it. I know that um, Sepp Holzer uh, has a thing that he says where it's kind of like the problems that we're trying to create were made with these this giant diesel-powered equipment. And, um, and he can see no way to repair the problems without the giant diesel-powered equipment at this time. And so... Uh, I, I kind of agree with that. And um, I, I want to minimize our use of diesel and at the same time um, rooting for that new electrical stuff. Okay, what are we looking at in this picture here? Just some, like a staging area, just some space. It's just like not really, so this is across from our house and the person who lived at our home before us, as you probably noticed with that huge garage, um, he worked on cars and so, um, that tells us a couple of things, right? There's probably a lot of gross stuff in this soil, but at, at any rate, it's space. Um, so I was just pointing that out. Uh, and those are some bricks for a small patio area that we put in. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of sun here, um, but really it's just sort of a staging area currently. Okay, and so this is at your property that's just shy of an acre. Yeah, exactly. So this is- Because that other property we were looking at earlier that had the bobcat, how many acres is that? No, so that's here actually. That is oh, it's the here. same property. It's the same property. Yeah, okay. same property. Um, but I just mentioned the reason we own the Bobcat. Uh, it'd be a little excessive for one acre. Um, <laughs> but we have it because of the other spot. So it's just currently on our house here. Ah, okay, 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 okay. All right, all right. Um, so we've got uh, a, a, a spot of soil that probably has been abused chemically. Um, not sure, but maybe. Yeah, it seems possible. A lot of invasives in terms of not weed and I mean, you know, however, you know, I'll just say things that we, did, we didn't plant that volunteered, we'll say that. Right, which oftentimes in the permaculture world, the things that volunteer, uh, oftentimes labeled invasives, are some of the things we want. They're like, oh yeah, no, this is great. Let's have Oh yeah, there's gradients, right? I mean, I'll take bittersweet over not weed any day now. <laughs> yeah, and then there's of course some invasives which are like, oh yeah, I'm going to, um, discourage you and so and there's exactly. some asphalt there too I can see the asphalt right and uh, do you guys I imagine you guys do have uh, mullen over there right I don't know if I'm familiar mullen yeah I'll sometimes call it great mullen uh, verbascum thapsis uh, it's I don't know it's a uh, anyway the reason why I mention it is I've seen uh, mullen tear up asphalt and uh, it's like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do this spot right now, but I'll plant a little mullen there <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, let the mullen do its thing for a few years while I work on other places. And then I'll come back to this later. But I, I kind of think that if I own this property, I'd probably be digging up the asphalt and hauling it away. That is in the short term. Uh, we want to replace it with um, probably crushed stone or something more natural. As you can see, there is some. So this is a view facing the house from where I just showed you. So just kind of giving you some more context of where we sit on the hill. So okay, we're, we're up on the top of the hill. I'm glad to see slope. Slope is so much better to work with than something flat. Um, but, okay, was that garden we were looking at? Was it over here? Exactly, exactly. Right? Okay, all right, all right. And then there's the bobcat. And uh, is this some kind of, it uh, looks like cement-based bricks in here. It is, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the point taken about the cement, so that's like right next to the house. We'll, we'll avoid putting that anywhere near anything. We, anyway. Yeah. But... I mean, go ahead and use it for stuff, you know. Um, I would probably get rid of the commercial compost and then the purchased wood chips. Mm -hmm. the, the toxins that are going to be in your cement are pretty well locked up. They're like, like I'm kind of thinking like, go ahead, make your thing that you're going to make with whatever, the, whatever you're doing with these bricks. That's all, you know, it's going to be relatively inert. It's, it's not a big toxin vector. Um, I mean, the mission is, is to be better, but not perfect. 
And so I'd probably get rid of the compost and the wood chips, but I'd probably try to make use of these bricks still. Unless, and, and well, I, yeah, if I got the bricks for free, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and use them. But if you paid money for them and you could take them back, I, I might, but that's me. But I'm not, they're not as bad as some of the other things. Like mm -hmm. the asphalt, I would take the asphalt you know, and I'd go do something else with it. Um, Cause it looks like it's in an area where you're, you're not thinking like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to park things here. I want to park the vehicles here and stuff. So, <clears throat> all right. Is that the, Oh, there's, there's one more. Here's one. And more. this was just uh, yeah, this is just to show another angle we have. Um, this was on the right hand side, you can kind of see those vines climbing what it was a stump. So okay. that was a big old Oak tree that cast a lot of shade all over the house and over this area. Um, and then beyond that, we just have this angle. So I, you know, I'd want to figure out something interesting to do with it to hold the hill. Um, I was going to, you know, spread like a green cover crop sort of mix to see if I could try to build up the soil that way. But um, something that's maybe not huge cost but holds the hill, you know. But yeah, it's more right. ornamental in this space. You know, I, I don't see myself growing anything edible in this space just because I can already tell that they're. I think that to build the house, they brought, brought a dozer in and kind of pushed the hill in. And filled, you know, because when I was first digging up some spots in the yard, our topsoil is, uh, my, my neighbor jokes, it's called Worcester loam. I mean, Worcester, Worcester loam, which is essentially like, you know, two inches of some of like something that resembles soil and then like four inches of like old asphalt from the 60s. <laughs> so I don't want to grow in the ground very much at all. Ugh. Right? Okay. So that's why this area, I kind of just want to do what I can to rehabilitate it, but presume it's basically just like a gross urban site. So I wouldn't want to grow anything here that I would want to eat. Okay. Fun, Man, right? That kind of makes me feel sad and stuff, you know? It's like, yeah. Uh, all right. All right. Well, uh, I mean, a lot, there's, there's branches of permaculture where people are like, oh, let me take a site where it's been poisoned so thoroughly that nothing will grow. And I'm going to get stuff to grow there. And then I'm going to grow food there. And I'm kind of thinking like, what? Why would you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and, and granted, it is kind of an earth repair that they're doing. But I, I kind of feel a little bit like, you know, I'd rather start with land that's relatively untouched and um and then do magnificent things with that then then you know the, the path that they're suggesting so here you've got something that's really i mean the good news is is that yeah you've got some ivy growing on that stump i can see some broadleaf stuff growing in here and i'm kind of thinking well that's a good sign that that kind of shows that there's not some sort of persistent herbicide that was sprayed here what what kind of tree is this one here that is an oak that um, we had to trim some limbs off of. It is actually living, but it has that that leaner to the left that you probably see that we are going to take out. So that one is kind of making it look more dead than it is. And then the re one of the reasons we had to we remove some of the pines is you can probably see some dead material up in, in that tree. Um, so we had a lot of bittersweet, like very thick, like thicker, thick as your leg kind of vines. So clearly no one had sort of taken care of that part of the property for a while. Okay. Uh, well, taking care, relatively speaking, but they hadn't really they let the vines kill the trees, basically. Right, right. It it needed uh, it needed some, some gardener love in there. Okay. Uh, which way is south? Like which way? Um. So you would be you if you would be south facing north from this. So this is actually like the southeast angle of the house. So this is where we get the most sun. Okay. All right. So the sun's kind of at my back. Exactly. Um, yeah, it'd be on your it'd be on your neck. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, all right. All right. Good. Because I see all those trees in the back and I'm thinking like, uh Oh, I hope that's not South, but all right, great. So we're, we've opened this up. So we're getting lots of sun now and now, and now we can start uh, growing lots of things. Uh, rocks. I see lots of rocks. Love these rocks. Oh, good. Rocks, rocks, rocks. Rocks are nice and super organic and stuff. Um, we are wealthy in rocks, thankfully. So I've been trying to put them to good use as much as possible. Yeah, this looks like a very good use for the rocks where they are right now. Uh, I see the wood chips here. 
I see you've got a few plants kind of getting started in there. Um, I, I kind of would want to grow a bunch of stuff here that's going to hold this uh, bank up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, you know, trees, but you're, you're kind of saying like, oh, I don't want to, for this, I don't want to grow anything and then I'm going to eat. So it's going to all be ornamental. And, it, and that makes, you know, so I'm not sure what to suggest. Well, what would you put in there then? Because I don't, I don't necessarily think, I mean, because at the same time, um, you know, something that produces fruit doesn't necessarily mean that I have to consume it. You know, it could be one of my pollinators, right? Or maybe something that helps something else in the yard further away. Um, okay. What do you prefer for holding hills or what maybe establishes quickly in your experience? I know we're in a different context, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, um, like with our hugel cultures, which are very steep, I want them to keep that very steep shape and i started off with different kinds of uh brush and a couple of trees and a lot of grasses and uh, with the idea that i'm going to grow um a lot of uh, uh nitrogen fixers in there too the grasses are going to really groove on those nitrogen fixers and they're going to put up these super webby roots and, and a lot of and, and we we're trying to grow more and more each year we have more grain to grow more of the sepulchral grain has these massive massive roots <clears throat> and uh, so put a lot of organic matter in but I'm not sure that's what you want here and at the same time it's like okay so this is the southern side we don't want anything to get too terribly tall and start shading everything else where you might grow your foodie bits although like okay here's your front yard I mean is that also got this this soil that's full of gross stuff it's unclear because um, it's the front and not the back. Um, so it's possible that it doesn't. Um, the, I, that's actually the shortest. I usually leave the grass. Um, usually I leave it a lot taller um, and I just kind of let it go. And um, it seems pretty happy. So the roots seem to go fairly deep. I don't know if that, that doesn't really answer your question, but I haven't yeah. dug it up. I will say that when we put those, those are just some lilac bushes, you know, just some, some, some pretty things. Uh, um, so those, those in, in the wood chips, we did have to dig that area up and we didn't find the same material. Like it looked like just the soil that was here. Um, all right. All right. Didn't look like Phil. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right. I'm, I'm going to pretend that I am stuck on this property. I cannot get away. I have to make do with what I got. I would say that the first thing I want to do is like, I, I, I just got the no. So I, I think I would try and find um, some place that could test soils for certain kinds of toxins, specifically what your neighbor is warning you about, mm -hmm. and find out if it's for reals or not. I just, I would just have to know. I, it would drive mm -hmm. me crazy. I just, yeah, soil test makes a lot of sense. I think that it is the next logical step. But I mean, um, like, there's a soil test to find out, like, what kind of nutrients you put in the soil for whatever. No, but specifically the toxins. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, and I'm not sure, but it's like, if this is a common problem in your area, there's probably, like, like there's going to be people in your area that are going to know about, like, oh, yeah, that. Oh, test for that to see if you got hit with that. Here's the lab you got to go to. And so... Mm -hmm. I'd say I would just need, I would desperately need to know that. So let's say we're, let's say that's the case. That's what we have to deal with. Um, oh man, trying to grow food on any of this kind of gives me the heebie-jeebies. I mean, I would kind of want to try and do all the things that people do to kind of heal the earth uh, in a permaculture fashion to kind of, you know, draw the toxins out. But I kind of feel like the first thing is probably going to be to um, to tie, maybe even just dig a lot of it out and haul it away, and then the next step would be to go and find um, a place where the soil is uh, uh, good. It's it it's like packed full of weeds, and the weeds are just giant then um uh and and even if it's got the weeds you hate the most then still better than than the toxins in the soil um and then there's a couple of different ways of like okay now i'm going to bring in a dozen dump truck loads of that 
and, and put it in different spots so that I can start to grow things that are going to um, be less toxic. So it's like, take, you know, maybe take a dozen dump truck loads away and bring a dozen new dump truck loads in, maybe even more than that. Then, so okay, now, ah, uh, this is this is so painful for me. But um, now let's say the soil is all fine. Okay, uh, see where that one fence is that you got right there? Yeah, that sort of sad little boarded fence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. I can't quite see what all is going there, but I do know that what I want to do is I want to put in hugel cultures. But then again, that's that's kind of like uh, uh, a lot of people believe I'm a little too obsessed with hugel culture. And, and it's like, so it's, you know, your call, but if it's me and I'm there, that's what I do. Now, one of the things I want to do is like, okay, here's this window right here on the house. I'm going to pretend that happy people sit inside that house and think happy thoughts. And they look at this window to see happy things. In which case that means, and I'm gonna I'm gonna turn on this uh, feature that we have inside of here, and um, where I can I can draw, and so um, I'm going to I'm gonna make. Can you see my little purple line there? And yes. All right, so I'm gonna make this hookah culture, which is gonna be seven feet tall. And uh, steep. It has really steep sides. And and then uh, it's going to kind of, you know, come down over here. And, and so you've got this big old blob up off the ground made from the soil that's amazing from somewhere else. And then uh, I'm going to make another one right here. And this is also seven feet tall. And, and then it's, um, and there's another one that's seven feet tall. And it's gonna kind of come down like this a little bit. You know. So these big hugel cultures, and then there's gonna be uh, another one here Like that. So the thing is, is that out of these hugel cultures is going to start to be all this jungle that's going to grow out of them because the soil's deep, the soil's awesome, and full of great happiness. And it's your favorite place to garden. And and you park your rig here, and you walk through the hugel cultures all the time. And you look at your gardens, and you sit in the front room over there, and you look out to see this jungle. And you see more jungle this way than if the hugel culture was going a different way. Plus, we're taking advantage of your slope. If there's any cold air pooling up near that window for whatever reason, it's going to drain away to where this little bit of gravel is. All right. So that's that's part of what I would do after the, the soil thing is fixed. And then my primary gardens would probably be here in these hugel cultures. Yeah, All right, makes sense. Okay. I hadn't considered that. I, I, I like the angles. It's, I just I hadn't considered that whatsoever. Yeah, I think an important thing with hugel cultures, I mean, if I had more real estate here, I would make more interesting hugel culture shapes. But you do need a lot of space between each hugel culture um, in order, because you think like, oh, I only need like a two and a half foot wide path. But it's like, no, no, no. You need paths that are a good six to eight feet because the stuff on the hugel culture is going to grow out and leave you with very little space. <clears throat> but I think a cool thing is, is that when you look out that window to, to, you know, appreciate the jungle, the permaculture jungle you've made. Okay. Is that our last picture in here? I think it is. I think that's the very last one. What if I, I got a, this and pull 
uh, let me scroll now. No, it's still. Uh, how do I turn that off? There we go. It is the end. Thin. Scroll again. Yeah. All right. Now I I haven't um, read all the text bits. You know, it's actually okay because we've covered, I think, a majority of what, you know, what I had planned to sort of speak through, and I think kind of it, it organically kind of happened. Um, All right, is yeah, this, this your is just property one more. or is this like? It is. Yeah, so this is just down down um, at a lower elevation than actually that fence, but that's the garden fence from earlier, and yeah, this this is where a lot of the bittersweet was growing out up up out of before. And then we is trimmed this... it back this year, kind of kind of cut it all down down to the the base. So it'll definitely grow back again. All right. Okay. All right. So this is kind of off to the north, and um, it, you, it because the trees are big, you kind of get the impression that the guy with the cars hasn't been, you know, drooling oil out here. Mm -hmm. And and if there is something that was buried here a hundred years ago, that some sort of toxic gig. Um, the trees have the, the trees and the general soil breakdown and things like that may have mitigated that quite a lot. Um, and the fact that um, these uh, vines and trees are doing so good right here is a strong indicator that this soil is good. This might be a, a lovely place to do a, a, a little more uh, gardening of sorts or uh, to, to put in some more hula culture. Now, I imagine that we're kind of like looking like this is probably the northeast side of the property. Is that about right? Yeah, that is right. Okay. All right. Um, and we're a little lower. And so um, we're kind of like a little downhill of the sun. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, again, I, I want to I do everything in hula culture. I want to add texture to the landscape. I mean, if you if you take this and you put in these great big tall hugel culture beds, you kind of double or triple the amount of plant plantable area that you have on your just shy of one acre. So you're just shy of one acre, you kind of end up with an acre and a half of uh, uh, growable soil by adding massive texture to the landscape. Oh, yeah, I like that. that. I think that makes sense. Right, it's so basically the left of this, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So now this picture, we're probably looking quite south. Is that right? Exactly. <laughs> okay. So I don't know how much of these trees are your trees. Actually, those are all neighbor's trees, unfortunately. We took out most of what we had on our border here. So just a couple of those tall oaks that are on the left. Okay. All right. So you've kind of taken out the trees that you're... Mostly, like, there, there might be a couple more trees you could take out, but um, yeah, there's probably, probably most of this you cannot touch. Is that true? That's true, yeah. Okay. I would, I would uh, take a lawn chair out and I would put it in front of these trees and I'd, I'd face the trees and I think I'd spend a couple of hours scratching my chin trying to think of like, what might be my strategy to talk to my neighbor? Are you, like, do you talk to your neighbor there? I don't know. Uh, I do see him occasionally, and I, I, I think he'd be open and over time to doing something about them because he just basically uses that property to have a shed and keep his boats. He doesn't really use it right now. Ah, okay, okay. So this could be something where. Uh, I don't know, perhaps I'm going to pretend for a moment that you, sir, are a magnificent chef and pie is your specialty. And you've made this magnificent pie that meets your region. Like if you're in Montana, it would be a huckleberry pie. And and that's like, and, and you could take the pie over to your neighbor and say, yes, I'm trying to soften you up because I have a request. And, uh, and uh, I, you know, you might... I'm 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 totally cool with you saying no. You still get to keep the pie, <laughs> and so <laughs> it's like. Uh, uh, but I just I'm, I'm kind of doing a little gardening here. I'd like to get a little bit more sun on my gardens, and uh, you know what can I do 
to get it so I can get more sun in my gardens and bring you more happy, happy, joy, joy. Um, something on that path. Cause I, I would want, I personally, if I'm, if I'm stuck here, I have to be here and I want to, I want to grow more than, um, then yeah, I want to get more light on my growies. And, and plus a lot of those trees look like they're conifers. And uh, exactly. that's, that's going to, that's going to be setting me back on my plans. And so it's like, uh, if you want to, keep those trees and get them to grow big and tall. It's on your property. Nothing I can do, but I thought I would ask and in the hopes of uh, there might be something I can do uh, for you uh, in exchange or something like that. So I can get more light on my gardens. Okay. So there, so that'd be a thing. Um, and then again, you know, I can see some slope, going where well, here's the uphill and here's the downhill. So I'd want to make a nice long hogel culture over here, assuming of course that there was more light to work with. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Here's another picture of the same thing, slightly different angle. Yeah. And there's all your growies inside. Is this a tomato right here? Yep. Those are mostly tomatoes in there. Okay. I would I would like to suggest that uh, when you grow your tomatoes that uh, that you uh, mix in a lot of other things. Um, so uh, consider guilds and polycultures. Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, companion planting these kinds of things. So that way your plants will be even happier uh, if they're growing next to like their their roots are mingling with the roots of certain other plants then uh, they do they do even better. We're going to try a different guild next year. This year, I guess what we tried was the tomatoes were on the end of each row, and then the middle were basil and um, either cilantro or parsley. Um, but cilantro bolted really quickly. It was definitely too sunny in that spot for it. So we'll okay. try something different for sure. Um, but yeah, I think, I think also just less tomato, more diversity. I agree. OK. All right. All right. And of course, I'd like to see everything up on hugel culture beds rather than because this is all pretty flat. It looks like you've got it's a little bit raised. It's raised like about seven inches or so. Um, we could raise it more. Yeah, I'd is like this. To. Uh, is this clay in here? Is that what I'm seeing? It's very clay. Yeah, it's very just clayish. So that's why we're trying to see if we can, you know, my, my, my what I was thinking to do is um, try to spread some of the like, green cover crop mix and see how that grows up and then kind of chop and drop and over time till it in. But that will take time, of course. I don't know if that's right. a good way to try to go about it or not. Yeah, because right now, and, I, and normally when somebody says till it in, I, I say, oh, every time you till, you lose 30% of your organic matter. Mm -hmm. But the, the looking at the image, it's like, oh yeah, there's not really any organic matter in that right now. <laughs> You're not going to, you know, if you, losing 30% of nothing is nothing and exactly tillin is going to help but if it's a lot of clay this is again where hugel culture really helps because uh clay tends to puddle easily and then your growies tend to drown now you've got slope which helps to prevent the drowning but that also means that when you do get moisture it all just kind of runs off and so uh hugel culture is great in that um you'll get good drainage um, which is something that when you have clay soils, it's like, boy, I, I want a way to have better drainage kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, all right. Do you get much, it looks like you probably don't get much in the way of wind there, but Massachusetts. You'd be surprised actually. We get, we're on the top of a hill where we are. So wind is a factor to think, consider. Um, especially in some of, like if we have a storm or something, we definitely get it. Cause I think we're at a fairly tall point on that hill um, and we go down to a lake. And so I think it just, the wind sort of goes down to that lake and swoops through our property. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I think that the trees are going to slow down a lot of your wind. And of course, we're talking about taking some of those trees down to get more light in. But with seven foot tall hugel cultures, they're going to make it so that the stuff at the top is going to get hit with the full force of the wind. But the stuff between the hugel culture beds um, depending on things, you know, the direction of the wind 
a lot of people say like, oh, you want to make your hugel cultures perpendicular to the normal direction of the wind. But my experience is, is that wind changes direction a lot. And, and that's like, but you don't, you don't have enough space to kind of get interlocking hugel culture beds so that no matter, because if you could do interlocking where the shapes are kind of curved and they kind of curve into each other, then uh, no matter what direction the wind blows, it can't get down between the hugel culture beds. Um, but uh, if you but you don't have enough space, so, so they'll be kind of straight. But that means that if the wind hits this straight direction, then it'll get down in there. But you're going to be like placing it in such a way that to go up to the house, because you're going to want your hugel cultures run uphill and downhill generally. And so there, um, I think that the house is going to help with if the wind happens to get between there. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, but if you can get the wind to stop, then um, because you're in a cold climate, so if you can get the wind to stop, then that's going to make the stuff between the beds uh, have be able to hold more moisture and uh, stay warmer because because wind will cool and dry. And oftentimes, uh, as gardeners uh, in a cold climate, we need things to be a little bit warmer. And, uh, um, and the summers around in, in our temperate zones tend to be pretty dry. And so uh, we, we would like to have something that could hold moisture a little bit better. Um, how much, it looks like you get a, quite a bit of rain there. I'm gonna guess that you're getting 28 inches of rain. Evan? I was on mute, my apologies. Uh, yeah, that sounds accurate. Um, I haven't actually checked how see what Worcester gets, but that sounds pretty darn close. That would be a good thing to, to look into, but I'm mm -hmm. just guessing based upon the kinds of soils that I'm seeing and the kinds of things that are growing there in areas that where people probably aren't caring for them. So mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna, that's, that's my guess. So you probably get um, more moisture than I get uh, you know, a, an okay amount of moisture, pretty decent amount of moisture. Um, but I'll bet your summers are still pretty dry. Like you'll go two months without a drop of rain. Yeah. Like this year was pretty brutal. We did have to actually, uh, bring in some water, you know, actually water, but we try not to. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. I, I have looked at your pictures. Yes, this has been this has been very helpful and only moderately scary. I think your points are very well taken and, 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 um, and I think they're, they're very, they're very, you know, relevant, you know, I think the commercial compost is definitely something I want to do some more due diligence on and see what we should do about that. Obviously the wood chips point very much taken. And then I'm really, yeah, now I'm thinking about the different angles for these, these, you know, my elevations here and seeing how I can use them, potentially put some Google bits in there. I think, especially with that, uh, maybe it was the first photo, I forget, but the, uh, the one with the steepest angle, I think that there's something, something that could do there. Yeah, this one. I think that this that's okay. that'll be my next my next plan. I think I really like that idea. Um, <clears throat> okay. All right. Cool. Uh, yeah, you want to get some more sun in there, and uh, I think bribing your neighbor and in, in the uh, with hat in hand is your best bet. Um, and that doesn't sound like you're crying, so I didn't make you cry. <laughs> no, not not no. Still, still, not even light sob. I think that was that was this is great. <laughs> oh, okay, all right, all right, cool, cool. No, I appreciate it. I, now, uh, um, what I've done so far is just look at pictures and bitch about whatever I saw, and mm -hmm. so now is the moment where you can just like maybe you had a question you needed to have answered, and that's why that's that's so maybe now you've got a, a question or two for me. Well, it's funny because the only other thing that we didn't cover, you sort of in a roundabout gave me an answer to because I was going to ask about rain catchment with that garage. But given our conversations about materials and off gassing, I don't think I want to do rain catchment off that garage. We were So the thing is we were going to put a new tin roof on it um, or, you know, aluminum roof. And it, maybe if we do that, I would consider it. But yeah. I guess, yeah, my question would be, you know, size wise, is it worth it? Also just materials, is it still too sketchy? Um, okay. That would be the only other thing I'd, I, I, I don't think we covered. Other than that, I think we covered most of what I was going to ask about. I, I think that there's a lot to be said for, for water catchment, but I kind of feel like people do water catchment for the wrong reasons. 
But here's another thing too, is it's like, let's say, um, cause like, first of all, you're on city water, which is chlorinated, right? Right. Yeah. We, we have to run, we just run some RV filters, which is not perfect, but it does something. Um, but yeah, we're on city water. So we try to either filter or we try to leave it out to dechlorinate it. And we have a couple strategies, but they're, they're not perfect. Okay. Now I remember hearing decades ago that the East and, and so you, sir, are in what I call the East. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I understand that like people say in the East, they say the West and they're talking about like Ohio, which is way East of me. <laughs> it's like, is that still in the Eastern time zone? So anyway, uh, uh, so I've heard of acid rain. Is that still a thing? It's funny you bring that up because I was just talking with someone recently about that. We don't believe it is, but we ha I, I actually want to do some research on it. Um, yeah. I think that that was a thing, I don't want to say it in the past, but it's not common to my knowledge now. Okay. But where you are, the, I mean, like I've been to Seattle and when I drive into Seattle, I see the big brown cloud and, and Seattle's famous for rain. I've been to Denver. Oh man, that's a brown cloud. Oh, wow. That's probably one of the scariest brown clouds I've seen. So I imagine the whole East Coast is one giant brown cloud because it's the population over there is so much denser. Um, and that means that when it rains, the brown cloud gets washed into your everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay, so I'm, I'm finding this lot. So I'm, I've got concerns about that. And of course, but at the same time, you're going to grow a garden and, and it's like, this is where you have to work with part of me kind of thinks like, okay, if you do water catchment, then yeah, there's ways you can kind of clean it a little bit. Um, and, uh, and some of those ways are kind of fun and cool and very gardener esque. Uh, and that's a whole nother podcast, but, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm mostly kind of thinking about like, man, it's a lot of work to irrigate your growth. Now, when you plant hugel culture, you, you, you got to water it the first year. So like, if you've got that soil, like we're looking at on your property where it's like, that's not soil, that's a bunch of clay or dirt or something. I mean, that doesn't have any organic matter in it. That's, that's just kind of scary looking. And so it's kind of like, all right, so here's what we got to do. We're going to build a hugel culture. And then we got to build the soil in the hugo culture. And in order to do that, we are going to need some water for the first two years. Um, the next thing is, is that sometimes you plant stuff in the middle of summer and you got to go over there with a watering can and give it a little shot of water. I know that when I lived in the city in Missoula, that I had a couple of barrels and I would fill them up with the city water and then let them sit for 24 hours before using the water on my garden just to get the chlorine out. Um, yeah, that's essentially what we do today. Yeah. Um, all right. So then like if you did, because a lot of people, it's like, I'm going to do water catchment and I'm going to have this giant tank that's going to hold all this water. And then I'm going to use the water from the giant tank for all my irrigation needs. <clears throat> and what I'm kind of thinking is, is that I prefer a path where like, let's design our garden so that we don't have to irrigate anymore. They'll need that irrigation for the first year or two. And then they won't need any irrigation after that. That's, that I think is the design. That's the thing to shoot for. Um, is, so the water that you get to your home is chlorinated. Is it really expensive? Uh, it's not terribly expensive. It's not, um, so it's, it's relatively affordable. It's been, this is our first year, like kind of running it for the garden when we needed to in the, in the off season. So we'll, we'll see, but generally speaking now it's, it's, it's fairly affordable. So okay. we're not going broke water in the garden. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thankfully. It, I, I kind of feel like, um, like let's say you put a new roof on, and then of course the water that's going to fall from the sky is going to have some toxic kick to it. But um, what if you had like, uh, um, you got the, you got the water 
uh, from the roof and then you ran it through some sand filters or maybe even a little bit of uh, some uh, gray water system reeds or something like that. And then what popped out the other side was much, much, much cleaner. And then you put that on your plants. I don't know. That'd be, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be, I mean, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, when, when you have a hammer, every problem's a nail. And it's so kind of like that, but when you're a gardener, every, the solution to everything is uh, plants. And, and I like the idea of like, okay, here comes some water. It's toxic. Not a, not a problem. I've got, I can grow some plants to clean that up. You know, I, I really like this approach. Like I'm going to work with the biology that's on my property to get this to be like way better. I like that idea. And, and what I had sort of thought about is on the back side of that garage that had the Bobcat park in front of it, there is some space. And so my thinking was capturing all the water to, some situation that gets routed to the back of the garage because then um it's hard to sort of see but on the left side of that if it was dug out a little more you could probably access it and my thinking was you know could i set something up back there that filters and maybe stores the water or you know because i had you at the machine maybe it's just like those ibc totes that you know you just got pallet forks right um, oh see there there you get into the whole part where i start kind of cringing in eight different ways because i kind of think to myself like all right water storage yeah um, i know i prefer not to store it so it's kind of like oh crap so you're gonna store it in plastic you're gonna right. store it in Ugh. cement what else you got and uh and yeah i mean we can store it in a big steel tank which will rust it's like uh we can store it in a big stainless steel tank, which will only cost like, you know, $5,000. And it's like everything kind of sucks in this department you know, for water storage, which kind of comes back to the whole thing of like, let's grow things in such a way that we don't have to bring water to it. And, yeah. and so, you know, minimize the amount of plastic in our lives, minimize the amount of cement in our lives kind of a thing. Ugh. Oh, ah. So you did answer my question. No, I think that that's actually very good advice because essentially my takeaway here is, is um, you know, really to be focusing more on my design of the spaces that I do have with, with sun and that I do have maybe not as nightmarish soil uh, and to build up some hookah beds. You know, I do believe I could probably find a source nearby of some reasonable material, like organic material that's not um, that's worth bringing in. So I think now it'll be a matter of me figuring out kind of um, – maybe a plan there and then looking into hugel beds for, for certain, you know, seeing how they fit into our space. Well, the other thing is, is, is some of this wood here. I mean, that, that vine that you're chopping out, that's driving you crazy, you know, put it into your hugel beds and then it, some of it might try to grow out and then just throw, you know, six inches of mulch on top of it. So it, it can't get through that. And, uh, but, you know, part of it is, too, is like when you get a brand new hugel bed going and it's got a bunch of weedy things in it, then um, the first year it's like you want to get anything to grow in it and do great because it's going to make lots of roots in there. And then, and then like the stuff that you don't want, it's like I start off with a lot of grasses my first year. Um, and then by the third year, it's like no more grasses. If you're a grass, you're in the wrong place. Mm hmm you know, and so all the grasses come out and then, you know, now I'm putting in a lot more food crops. Um, so it's, it's kind of like same thing could go for those vines, but you've got a lot of trees there. And then I would imagine that I'm not seeing brush cause you're took the brush out and it's like, well, where did all that brush go? Well, rather than running it through your chipper, if I want to put it inside of my hookah culture, first of all, if I, if, if the pieces are like, finger size or smaller i'm kind of thinking that's going to make some great mulch on my hugel culture bed and if they're bigger than that then it's like i'm going to take the loppers to that and that's going to be great for the inside of my hugel culture bed of course if they're big enough i start thinking about running stuff through the sawmill or um uh possibly bucking it up for firewood for a rocket mass heater which mm -hmm. i imagine you do not have 
<laughs> don't have, but I'm very interested. I do have, um, I did support that Kickstarter, so I've got plenty of videos to watch, or I have actually watched a bunch of them. So that's actually a plan for the other uh, property that we have. So awesome. I do love that idea, yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And and the message I wanna send to everybody who's like, cause you're, cause of course this property is well within some city limits. Is that right? Exactly, it is, yeah. yes. And And they would probably frown on a rocket mass heater. They might have building codes. A lot of, uh, I'm hearing that a lot of uh, uh, building codes regulators now have rocket mass heaters in their building codes. Um, I'm hearing more and more reports every day. It oh, sounds look into that. exciting. And a lot of insurance companies also love rocket mass heaters. So there's, there's that also. But for those places where you're missing one of those components, then of course, you got to do the exact same thing that everybody did with marijuana. And that is that nobody, not a soul used any marijuana at all until the government said it was okay. So we've got to do the <laughs> same thing. Just, you just wait and they'll come around. You just don't, don't be doing that. Don't be, don't be making a rocket mass heater where it's not okay yet. You know, just because, <laughs> just because it saves you thousands of dollars and solves global warming, that's no excuse. You gotta wait until well, it's okay. Just like what we did with marijuana. Yeah, that. Nobody, nobody touched the marijuana until the until magically said they it was did. Okay. Yeah. And then suddenly everyone was really good at growing it. Weird. Yeah, <laughs> like that. And, and really good at making these heaters. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. It's all good. It's all good. So, um, all right, Evan, do you have any other questions for me? Uh, Paul, this has been great, and I and I really appreciate your time. This has been a really helpful conversation. Um, even the even even the parts where you're giving me uh, the relative, you know, air quotes bad news. Uh, it's it's a good stuff, good stuff that I needed to hear. So, um, this has been great. Thank you. Well, good, good, and and remember, you 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 don't have to be perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think the thing to do is, is you, each year you're going to find a few things where you might, you know, do a little bit better. And then 10 years from now, you'll be amazed at how far you've come. Definitely. All right. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about site evaluations, homesteading, and permaculture all the time.